How you doing? Chelsea Cross here. It's Tuesday night, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, and it is the Blab Twitter Chat Collab Millennial Talk <laughs> style. Um, you know, we like to multitask here for Millennial Talk, and sometimes we have our Blabs, sometimes we just do our Twitter Chat. Tonight, we're doing it all, and we have an amazing guest who's definitely a repeat offender here for Millennial <laughs> Talk. We just had we just did another amazing Twitter chat, what, like three weeks ago, Erin? Was it a Yes, a couple, yeah, a couple weeks ago. Yeah. We just did one together for, for Capital One. Tonight we are also partnering with Capital One to bring awesome insight and conversation to the table for tonight's millennial talk. Erin, so happy to have you. You might Thank also you. know Erin as the broke millennial. She is teaching people that you don't have to be financially literate to actually understand how to financially organize your life, which I'm all about because I kind of choke up when it comes to numbers, but I do like to feel like I have a financial plan. Um, so I'm really happy to have you here tonight, Erin. How are you doing? Thank you. Um, I'm awesome. Excited to be here. Get some people, you know, demystified about the whole wedding and budgeting. And we're going to explain how to do this right and not go into debt for it. You know, I was looking at our rundown for tonight and I was like, you know, we're obviously we're talking about weddings, we're talking about how to prep budget plan for happily ever after, how what however you want to define happily ever after is up to you, of course. Yeah. Um, I'm actually getting married in 94 days. Ooh. I the countdown on my uh, the countdown app on your phone and I was like, "Oh, I totally thought it's going to be like 120 days." And I saw 94 and I was like, Ugh! I got to start the wedding diet officially. Um, Erin is also in a long-term relationship. We're going on yeah. six years. Six so years almost. Six years I in mean, September. That is a milestone in itself. So oh. we are definitely are on track to, you know, financially plan for ourselves as an individual, but yeah. also as a couple. So we have so much ground to cover tonight, Erin. Obviously, for all of the Millennial Talk veterans, you know how to do it. For everybody who is joining us maybe for the first time, or the first time doing a Blab Twitter chat collab, this is how we do it. I will be sending out all of the questions for tonight via Twitter. Make sure to join in on the conversation using hashtag Millennial Talk, of course. And then feel free to engage in us on the actual Blab IM feed here. It, it does get um, quite busy. I see all people are starting to join in. It, um, we're five minutes past the top of the hour. So feel free to chime into the conversation on Twitter or here on Blab. We will be taking callers if you want to call in and ask a question, state an opinion, give us some insight, some tips. Open conversation, so much ground to cover. Let's definitely get started, Erin. Let's do it. So here we go, sending out Q1 right now on Twitter. I always like to make this note um, that if you see me veering off, it's because I have my Twitter feed here, my script here, the blab here, so I'm always paying attention. But again, me and Erin are both multitasking. Today. Hashtag millennial. <laughs> Hashtag millennial. So get your answer ready, Erin, or if you didn't already, send it out. It's ready. <clears throat> Wonderful. Here we go. Pulling up the Twitter sphere. All right, all right. Wonderful. All right, so let's dive into it. So our first question, which I'm also going to send into the Blab feed right here as well, is marriage means a joint commitment and joint finances of course what is the best way to address this convo with your partner and actually i tried to say this before and totally you off but i was looking at the script there before we fly in my office before we started and i was like wow there's actually so many conversations there's so many themes within our chat tonight because we're obviously talking about financial preparation but we're also talking so much about communication and within relationship yeah and i feel that exactly i feel like communication is so key and if there is that lack of communication that's where certain things go south so i, th I feel like we're hitting so much great ground tonight um, so let's take it away. So Erin, what is your opinion about Q1? So my big thing, and it's a term that I say over and over and over, is you have to get financially naked and you have to do it early. And what this means is that you both need to have a conversation with each other and strip down to your underwear of money and talk about what your debt burdens, what are your savings goals, what do your plans for the future look like? You know, if your partner is on the, let's say the early retirement track and he wants to retire at 35 and you are $45,000 in student loan debt and that seems completely unreasonable, 
you don't want to wait until after you say I do to have that conversation. You want to have that conversation, hopefully, before you even get engaged. Definitely. I love the whole financially naked because it does, yeah. we're talking about money, you all of a sudden feel like you have just been stripped of all your clothes. You are feel you know, that vulnerability. It's so vulnerable. And the other thing, so for me personally, I don't have student loan debt and I've never carried any form of debt, but my partner, he was not so fortunate and he does have some student loan debt. And it's a conversation we started having very early on in our relationship because I'm a money nerd. <laughs> and so part of what it was was just kind of easing into it. You know, we didn't get totally naked all at once we took a couple pieces off at a time until we got to a point where we felt really comfortable mm -hmm. and then the other thing is we started to figure out how do we want to plan together for money do we want to be a team or is this going to be an individual effort and then starting to create that conversation as well you know I love that you're being so honest and talking about you know we're all Erin and I are also stripping naked vulnerability naked. sure are um, and talking about our relationships and personal experience through tonight's topic. Um, and both my partner and I, I, I don't mind saying my partner's name, Jordan. Jordan and I both have also do, do not have any debt, thankfully. Mm -hmm. um, and we definitely always, you know, remind ourselves of how lucky we are that we're not the norm because, you know, the average... Uh, college grad is, is graduating with about $30,000 worth of student loan debt today. And the ripple effect of student loan debt is just really stifling. Um, yeah. And it's like, you know, do you have to think about it to, for all the, for, for people who are single or just dating? It's like, what, at what date do you ask if you have any debt? <laughs> so that's a great question. Right. And I do think it's kind of a statistical probability at this point to throw out some SAT words that at some point you're going to either date or marry a person with debt and you could both have the debt or just the one of you has a debt, but most likely someone's bringing debt into the situation. Mm -hmm. And that could be student loans, credit card, auto loan. Maybe you're marrying somebody who already got a house that's considered good debt, but it's still debt and it's right. something you have to talk about. Um, I would love for people to bring their credit reports on the first date, but I know it's not going to happen. So my answer to that is always around the time that you think I could spend the rest of my life with this person is when you need to have this conversation. Conversations get really real. And I'm also, yeah. I, I, ironically, I don't know about you, Erin, but I, it, it seems to be the time where people are starting to think about rings, starting to budget for the ring, or just start, got um, engaged. Or I just have a few friends that, you know, are slowly starting to actually just get married already. So, and then I have uh, some older friends who are on the baby track. Yep. I'm totally not there. Me neither. That stifles <laughs> me even more. The thought of, uh, one, the financial commitment of a child, but the thought of a child at the moment. So we're talking just weddings here. Um, but... It, it just seems that um, some people who I who who I've talked to, like they, it, I'm alarmed at the fact that they haven't had a lot of financial conversations. So, do you normal? I mean, how do you even address it? In your opinion, it's like, hey, you know, let's sit down, let's have a financial conversation, let's, you know, like, how do you ease into? How, what's the icebreaker for the financial conversation? So on my site, brokemillennial.com, I do have a financially naked checklist. And one of the things that you have to do very early on is just kind of lay the groundwork. Mm -hmm. And part of what laying that groundwork is, is just getting a sense of where your partner might be based on statements. Does he or she say like, oh, I'm not gonna be able to pay my bills this month. Have a debt collector ever called your partner? Are, uh, you know, if you cohabitate, are items coming in the mail that maybe you, are a little bit alarming for like credit cards that are la less than credible or for like uh, collections agencies, anything like that is sort of a red flag. Now, if that's not happening, because that's sort of an extreme scenario, you just start, I would say start with the positive. Say like, what does retirement look like to you? Or, you know, how much do you want to have saved before you have a kid? Mm. Anything like that that just kind of gets the conversation starting. And then it's a more organic way to back into Okay, so if you want twenty thousand dollars in the bank by the time you have your first kid, where are you now? Right, and then you can sort of plan that way. Mm -hmm. And you both have to get naked. If one person has debt and the other person doesn't, it is not fair that the one person gets totally naked and you sit there staring at him, right. and then you're all bundled up in the warmth of being debt free. You got to both share. And and the reality is is that statistically one out of two is is most likely about to have debt. So it's like it's just it's unfortunately the norm at this point. And hopefully, 
going forward with this new election. I don't know. I just feel like the student loan debt crisis is not getting enough attention in the political sphere, um, especially being that we are the generation of the future. But we're talking happily ever after, not happily <laughs> ever after. So <laughs> with that being said, I'm going to send out Q2, Erin. Get your answer. Right. Here we go. Q2 being sent out right now. And I see all the people engaging on Twitter. Thanks so much, guys. And for those of you who are just joining into our Blab, we're also having a full-on Twitter chat on Twitter and using the hashtag, of course, hashtag Millennial Talk. If you are wanting to engage in both, which I totally think it's awesome if you would like to, um, TWUBS, T-W-U-B-S, or Tweet Chat, really helps to streamline the conversation. When you log into that platform, it'll ask you what hashtag you want to use. Type in Millennial Talk, and then it'll kind of streamline all of the tweets using the hashtag Millennial Talk. You never have to worry about adding the hashtag. It's, it's really a great platform. Love it. Um, all right, so Q2. Here we go, Erin. When it comes to planning a wedding, where do you even begin when it comes to deciding a budget? I love this question because that, that moment where Jordan and I were like, okay, we're engaged. We processed it, and then we had to then start making moves on the wedding plans. We were like, oh, this is real. <laughs> so what's your opinion? You know, where do you even start? Um, I think you start first by the two of you having a bit of a conversation about the type of wedding you want to have. You know, are you going to go to City Hall or are you going to have 400 people or do you want something more intimate at maybe like 75? You know, the two of you have some sort of plan and then realistically your parents get involved. At which point they have a say, especially if they're contributing financially about certain people on the guest list. And the other thing is if you're paying for the whole thing out of pocket, just the two of you, you can push back on who's getting invited, especially if your mom wants to invite her gynecologist because he brought you into the world. This <laughs> story happening to a friend of mine, and you're paying, you can be like, you know, mom, I don't think he needs to be there. Yeah. Well, now, if your parents are paying a bit of a different situation, it's it's a more delicate dynamic. It, you know, it is an interesting dynamic, and I, 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 I'm actually surprised at how many friends of mine are contributing to the wedding what actual, or paying the majority of the wedding. And I think that if you could afford that within your, you know, um, mid-20s, late-20s, whenever you're getting married, that is so incredible um, wow. and, and so honorable to be able to, to do that for yourself. Jordan and I are – actually contributing to our wedding too because we just went off of you. Uh, but I think that um, one of the stickiest problems that I have heard throughout all of the engaged um, or now married couples is that when, when the parents get involved. And I think aside from the conversation between fiance and fiance about budget and the ideal wedding and what it looks like, mm -hmm. I also think people it is so helpful to actually have a conversation about how to go about having the conversation with the parents. That's an appointment. Yeah. Jordan and I sat down separately um, with our parents before having a joint conversation with our parents. And it was so smooth and organic and everyone was on the same page. And it's because Jordan and I really took the time to talk to them individually where, you know, it's not mm -hmm. as all eyes on the person of what that budget they have or something like that. Right. Every um, every every engaged couple that you know kind of followed us, uh, we gave that piece of advice first and foremost, and they said that was the best thing that they did, um, and made that what could be an awkward conversation yeah. not as awkward. So I think the other thing you want to do, especially for you as a couple, because do it early once you get into it. There, there's so many expectations and every little thing seems so important by the time you get into it. But early on, decide what do I really value? What do I really want to spend money on? Uh, if you really just want to dance, make sure you have an awesome DJ. If you really are big foodies and you care about the food, make sure the caterer is amazing. If all you care about is having photographs of this memorable day, get the best photographer you can afford. And put your money towards what you actually care about. And then penny pinch in other places. Do you need ridiculous centerpieces that are just going to get thrown in the trash afterward? No. I Scrimp there and put it somewhere else. I cannot believe how expensive damn flowers are. That's all I'm oh. It's just, you know, they're beautiful. I have a hack. <gasps> sure. 
And it depends, it totally depends on where you're getting married and the type of, you know, ambiance you're going for. But when my best friend got married, she actually got her bouquet and our bouquets at a grocery store. They were beautiful. You can do grocery, she went in, she ordered them ahead of time, but they don't do the ridiculous upcharge just because they hear the word wedding and then immediately tack on like 50% upcharge onto oh it. And yeah, it was gorgeous. You know, I would have absolutely never have thought to do that. Uh, and that is such a great hack and such a great tip. All right, yeah. gotta, gotta explore the grocery store. I know, they can do it all. I love it. There's so much, so much conversation going on in the Blab feed. Um, doo -doo -doo. I'm just making sure that we're not missing out on any questions. And again, feel free to give us a call if you do have a specific question or a certain piece of advice, tip, tool, resource. We love it here on Millennial Talk. But we actually have 15 questions tonight and a lot of guys have to cover. <laughs> so I'm going to start prepping Q3 in the Twitter feed. Erin, go ahead and get your answer ready as well. All right. Here we go. Moving right along. Oh, this is this was crazy. I found some interesting facts that went along with this question. So Q3 for the evening is, if you had to take a guess, what do you think the average cost of a wedding is? And everyone tweet and lab in your, you know, what you could possibly think the average cost of a wedding is. I was actually really off <laughs> in my guess before I did. What did you think? I actually thought the average cost was about twenty thousand. Um, and I was thinking thirty. You were thinking thirty. Okay. Yeah. I just think I, I I don't I I was really I'm just so aware of how you know the average people getting married today are within their middle late twenties and mm -hmm. debt 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 debt. So I was just thinking you know strapping because of the debt in particular. Oh, well, you think people are acting rationally, which is a key mistake there in that assumption. And the crazy thing is that so many people are actually putting themselves further into debt because of oh, yes. what, Big problem. what they're spending on their wedding. Um, but I, did you, I, it also depends where you live. Like New York, I think, here in New York City, I think the average wedding is something around seventy or $72,000. Oh, my gosh. Well, it's like, you know, a water bottle in New York City is $5. <laughs> I can only imagine. We're known for expensive water. I can only imagine a buyout of a restaurant or a venue. Oh, God. especially a hotel in Manhattan. It's you know, pro that's probably twenty thousand dollars alone. Oh, easily. Well, I did some research, and I'm sure you did some as well. But I found through the knot, gotta love the knot dot com, mm -hmm. that the average cost of a wet of a wedding actually rose to over thirty two thousand dollars last year. An increase of more than five thousand dollars from two thousand ten. So people got more money to spend, or people are just more willing to go all out. Um, but for people who are in debt currently, uh, mm -hmm. and and you know going to spend money like in the thirty thousand, twenty thousand. I mean, how ridiculous or not ridiculous do you think that it is? This is going to come off sounding very harsh to people I know. I think it's asinine if you personally are putting yourself in debt for a wedding because the wedding is a day. Your marriage is what matters. Mm -hmm. So you are setting up your marriage to be more difficult early on in your relationship by putting yourself that much deeper in debt. Yeah. So it just doesn't make sense to do that. And there are places you can you can cut back. There are ways that you can still have a gorgeous, beautiful wedding and have everyone you want there and have a great time and not have to spend thirty two thousand dollars for it. Right. I mean I mean think about all that all of what you can do with thirty two thousand dollars. A house. A yeah, car. Exactly. Exactly. Prepare for a child. <laughs> A cushion just to, you know, have yeah. the bank so that who knows what happens down the road. I mean, marriage is a lifelong commitment, not a day, like you said. Yeah. yeah. Well, I had to throw in that question because I wanted to see what people would say. A lot of people are saying in the 30K range as well. Some said 25,000. Um, and then, gotta love Wes. Let's remember it's the wedding industry, not the wedding, not 
nonprofit outreach. Be, <laughs> be wise in what you spend. Yeah, forty thousand. Someone said, "Wow, all right, big spenders here, everybody." Fifty thousand. Wow. All right. Well, let's let's move on and uh, be a little bit more savvy in the way that we spend or prep for a happily ever after. Let's send out Q4 right now, sending it out on Twitter. Here we go. We'll send it out on Blab as well. Q4. One of my cute little graphics. There they are. Q4 sent. And Q4 also coming up on the lab. I liked that somebody else in the Blab live chat mentioned um, if people were rational, they wouldn't have debt, which behavioral economics at its finest. We're not rational human beings. It's 100% true. Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, that's a, debt is a whole hour long millennial talk lab Twitter chat in itself. So as are, Absolutely. Totally. So, okay. Here is Q4. Q4 sent out on Blab as well. So how much and how long should you save for a wedding? I think this is a really great question. I'm sure there's a lot of variables. Yeah. There as well. I mean, you should save as much as you need to to not go into debt, which is a very not helpful answer. <laughs> I say that in terms of how for how long, it depends on what kind of a saver you are. If you know 100% this is the person you're going to marry and you know for sure your parents are not going to be able to help contribute, start saving before you get engaged. Right. If you feel like that's going to freak your partner out, just don't tell him or her and just put it in a separate savings account, but start tucking away 50, 100 bucks every month to chip away at that cost. Right. Um, and then in addition to that, once you do get engaged, the two of you should have a sit down conversation about your finances before even you talk about the wedding and see where everything stands. And then you can each figure out on top of current bills and debts and current savings goals, you shouldn't choose saving for retirement and everything else while saving for a wedding, mm -hmm. how much you can put aside. And just kind of team effort it like that. You just need to consistent, do it consistently, right. do it early, and have a conversation. So do you feel like, okay, so you're in a great circumstance. You've been dating for six years. Obviously, yeah. relationships go very well. Do you yeah. start talking about putting a savings? You know what? Aside from actually prepping from happily ever after, you know, for people who are in relationships and know that they want to, you know, be in that relationship, maybe they're just not ready for marriage, you know, mm -hmm. do you recommend a joint savings account? I do not. Uh, the only time I would really say that that might make sense is if you're cohabitating and you split the bills and you each put a small portion of your income mm -hmm. in there. And it's a portion you don't mind that other person walking with if there's a very bad right. breakup and they have access to your bank account. I don't think you should combine anything financially until you are legally bound to one mm -hmm. another. And I, I don't mean to be a cynic. It's just the practical, prudent thing to do for you and your money. You know what? life happens things happen it does and i've had friends who have been with people they thought that they were going to get married to they bought a home together they had a joint checking together but they weren't married and then they broke up and it was nasty and money got taken and that's sometimes just how it goes yeah and it's like why make it more sticky unless it's you know legally yeah down. exactly you're really moving forward together as a you know joint legal entity now once you're married, I'm all for joint checking and joint banking and having open disclosure about all of that. Mm -hmm. And I think you should talk to each other about how much you have and how much you're saving and all of that when you're engaged and getting towards that point. I just don't think your money should be tangled up together until it's official. Mm -hmm. I actually found a fact on CNNMoney.com that the median household income is around $54,000 for a couple and are spending more than 50% of their annual income on their wedding. Ooh. And I'm just like, who? That's what the honey fund is for. <laughs> if you're getting married later in life, those things are and awesome. I'm just like, why? Because I think people get so wrapped up in the day and then forget that that day mm -hmm. is over, what the ripple effect of that day might cause for them. Yeah, absolutely. I do think you should take some time to celebrate 
and you know decompress and go on a honeymoon but it should be affordable right. to right. you like and, and it should be something the two of you want to do you shouldn't just go to an all expense paid resort in jamaica if that's not the style of traveling if you like to do if you're more people who want to explore and get into the nitty gritty of an area and maybe go hiking then do that right. or go backpacking you know in California or do something that's that speaks to you guys and is affordable totally and actually Daniel here in blab was like you know honeymoon doesn't necessarily have to be immediate if it works better financially to do it you know down the road maybe help you know not get into debt if you put the honeymoon into the overall budget and I had um, actually my cousin did her honeymoon six to seven months after the wedding and she said it kind of just like brought back the excitement of getting married and um, they went on just like a little staycation right after the mm -hmm. wedding and she said it was a really like wonderful way to kind of like relive the wedding feel not I mean you hopefully have that six months after you get married but like you know true <laughs> <laughs> but uh continued made it an extended you know long Right. And, and you know it gives you another six months to just kind of save up a little bit more of a cushion to maybe do something that much more fabulous yeah all right q5 in the queue here we go so much chatter tonight this is fabulous q5 I also like this point, I'm just going to say it while you're queuing up, that you can save thousands if you don't tie the knot during wedding season. And that is a great point from Courtney K. Norris, or Norris, I'm not sure, but um, that is a great point from Courtney, that if you get married off season, you can save so much money. And if you get married on a Friday, not terribly convenient for your guest list, but if you're trying to trim the fat off, people won't come. Yes, and it also absolutely. Is and somebody got married on a Tuesday. Good for you, Legacy <laughs> Park City. I actually saw that in a few like hacks to, you know, decrease the yeah. budget and um, yeah, isn't it funny? Like everyone seems to get married during wedding season. It just amps up your price that much more. Yeah, um, and it could depend on where you're getting married. That maybe like certain amenities only available at their best at certain times, but. It's all about what you value, and you need to eyes wide open that you're going to spend more if you get married during those peak seasons. Totally. All right. Well, here is Q5 in Blab. It is officially sent out on Twitter. Here we go. Oh, yes. And also, at Rob Servatory, just be careful about marrying or near a holiday season as well, because, of course, that's always going to bump up the cost for venue 100%. It's also obnoxious for your guests. I was talking to somebody about this today, actually, that if you get married on a holiday, Memorial Day, 4th of July even, if you think you're being nice because people usually have a three-day weekend, but then flights are more expensive. So really, I would have rather taken the PTO day and come to your wedding or just flown in on Saturday morning than I have to pay an extra $75 for my No, ticket. and I also feel no, no offense to anybody who's joining us tonight who's done it on a holiday or three-day weekend, but I feel like people like to have their holiday weekends to themselves. Oh, yes, they, that's true. I had to go to a wedding on New Year's Eve, and I was not You know, like, about it. your holiday is your holiday. Um, just a thought. <laughs> but yeah. New Year's Eve to me is, like, the biggest offender yeah. for some reason, especially – if you have to go as a guest, I wasn't, I didn't even know the couple. I was going with my boyfriend. It was like his family friend. I was like, oh, I have so many places I'd rather be than Right, especially people. if you really, you know, don't have strong feelings for yeah. people getting married. But uh, yeah, totally. All right, well, Q5, here we go. Um, planning a wedding should also come along with thinking about the future. We've really been touching on that throughout the chat thus far. So where can you save? when making wedding plans. We did touch on, you know, to avoid wedding season, try to avoid the holidays. Um, obviously the, the holidays are gonna bump up flight costs. Any other hacks to help trim the fat in some areas? So I do, I go back to that first point where it's pick what you value and spend the money on that and then don't focus on anything else. And the dress, that seems like a big place you can save a lot of money because so many people end up spending you know six thousand dollars on a dress and they're gorgeous don't get me wrong but if you seriously are only going to wear it once 
Um, you could rent it, just a thought. They do have that option now. There are a ton of services that mm -hmm. offer rentable wedding gowns. And if you don't wanna do that, see if maybe there's one in your family that could get passed down and altered to fit you and your style. You know, go to discount boutiques. There's nothing wrong with getting your dress from a place like that that's not, you know, fancy pants Kleinfelds, but it's still gonna be a gorgeous dress. And as long as you feel good, Absolutely. Who cares and you know, there's I also a lot of resources out there that could help you, you know, we're talking future here, um, that could help you save for future and especially weddings, cars, homes big purchases, big chunks of change out of the wallet. And we're, you know, we're happy to be partnering with Capital One for tonight's Blab and Twitter chat. The Buy Power card from Capital One is a great option to make your wedding expenses count towards the future. So earnings from every purchase can be used towards the purchase or lease of a new Chevy, Buick, GMC, or Cadillac vehicle. So those wedding expenses can be count, can, you know, actually count beyond just the festivities. They could actually be helping you save towards upgrading your car right. for things like growing your family after marriage. So great resources to be able to tap into where you feel like, all right, you know, big purchase, but has like a, a long-term gain as well. Yeah, you should absolutely be getting the most of your spending. And part of that is definitely using a rewards card. If you're going to be buying thousands of dollars worth of merchandise, then you should get <laughs> right, a little bit. Exactly. Little and I feel like, you know, especially if you're talking about, you know, future and growing the family, usually that comes along with a little bit of a bigger car. Mm -hmm. So um, upgrades in the car up, or potentially, you know, you know, your first home, which is also very exciting. Our last week's Twitter chat was first time home buying. Um, so uh, lots of exciting things when thinking about the future and lots of great resources like the Buy Power mm -hmm. Card to be able to tap into as well. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So let's get Q6 out there. Oh my gosh, 8.35 already. Erin, where does the time go? Here it goes. Here we go. Send it out on Twitter. And we'll send it on Blab real quick. Here we go. Here's Blab. Loving how on fire our Blab is right now. It's awesome. Yeah, people always have strong feelings about wedding right. and strong feelings about money. So the totally. two combined are amazing. Okay. Q6 is out. Let's jump into it. So, Q, sorry, Q7. How can the bride and groom best utilize the registry to help them plan and save for the future? I don't think we did finish Q6, did we? I have to have that. Well, we touched on it earlier, though, about talking to your parents about I'll send, I'm going to reverse it. We'll do Q6 after Q7. <laughs> Yeah, no problem. Let me send okay. out my Q7. I'm going to send it out on Twitter. So one thing that is big now um, that I'm hoping that the trend reverses as we age, but part of the problem is people still think it's a little tacky to give money. And it's not, but people think that. But as millennials are aging into being in their late 20s to early 30s when they get married, they might have all of the stuff they need, especially if they cohabitated before getting married. So the registry feels like a really antiquated notion. Like, I don't need hand towels and I don't need pots and pans. I've had those for years. So the honey fund or similar type things are a really great way to get money. But at the same time, if you're going on a honeymoon, somebody can like purchase something for you. So they can buy you a couple of massage in Tuscany or buy you a fancy dinner or like a wine tour or something that they feel like they're getting you a physical present and they're not just handing you money, even though just give us the money. You know, why do you think people think it's, you know, cliche or taboo or whatever, just to money. every couple uh, who's joint coming together, you know, for the rest of their life could use money and they just spend so much money. So why do you yeah. think that? Well, I think part of it is when you give a physical gift, even if it's off a registry where the price tag is clearly mm. stated on there, that there's less of a, I'm worth $50 to you, I'm worth $150 to you, or if you hand someone a check, then it makes it feel like this is how much you and coming right. to your wedding was worth. And I think that's a big part of the problem is you don't want to come off seeming like you're miserly, but you don't also maybe want to go yeah. above and beyond. So that's where some, I understand some of the pain points come, especially for the older generations where, 
you know, people got married in their early 20s and needed all this stuff for their house. So that's what they're used totally. to doing. My, mine and Jordan's first reaction to the registry was, we've also been living together for the past three years, living in sin. And, um, <laughs> you know, we needed plates and cups and a coffee machine. And when we got married, we were like, mm -hmm. wow, we really don't need anything. Like maybe we don't even registry. Right. And let me tell you, the older people, it was like I told them that, I don't know, something horrific that I didn't want to registry. And um, they twisted my arm and I was like, okay, fine. Like, I'll just get a registry. And they were like, you know what the registry yeah. is, is that nobody's going to go buy a plate or a silverware or a vase that's maybe just a little bit out of their price range. So let someone get it for you. Mm -hmm. And it's to, you know, you know, it, be excited about building your new home together. And after, I committed right. to the registry. I, you know, I decided I'm not going to just put anything and everything. I was not that bride where I went to the store and went beep, 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 beep to everything. Jordan and I really sat down and we're like, okay, what do we need? One, what do we never want to buy for ourselves? Two, and so that, you know, there could be certain ex items that we could be excited about, but otherwise, you know, just have people contribute to our financial fund right. um and then we could use that money to really a lot wherever we wanted to are we going to put it into the first home fund to the honeymoon honeymoon fund to the just savings emergency fund and um so we, we kind of met did a happy medium met met the older generation halfway <laughs> i do think it's nice to have a registry with at least a few items on there for the people who are going to get cranky about it but the other thing that a friend of mine pointed out after she got married and she got a couple mm -hmm. duplicate gifts not necessarily because the registry got confused because sometimes people will buy off registry and then they'll buy you your fourth toaster that you don't need. So they either tried to return them or she and her husband have a closet where they kept some of this stuff and have been regifting it for bridal showers, baby showers, future weddings. So then they didn't have to spend on the cost of buying that person a present. They already had it. You know so what? just something to do if you get annoying duplicate gifts. I think that's a great idea. And then you don't have to like inconvenience yourself with going to return like a hundred million things. And you know, there's right. nothing wrong with a good regift, especially if you didn't use it. <laughs> Yeah, never been touched. Totally sealed up. <laughs> All right, so now we're backtracking and sending out Q6. I got a little Q happy and sent out Q7 ahead of Q6. Here we go, sending out official Q6 right now. Send it out here on Blab as well. Legacy at Legacy Park City. Tell everyone not to buy a crystal. What a waste. <laughs> that or fine china if you're never going to use it. Gosh, I can't. I think both my mom, my grandmother, my other grandmother, my future mother in law have all said to me they've maybe used their, like, you know, crystal ware or fine china that they got for their wedding maybe once. And it's sitting on you know the top shelf right. all dusty. Right. That's just such a travesty. It's waste. Yeah, and it's it's just wasteful for everybody as well. And like they don't want it taking up space, but then they feel bad about getting rid of yeah, it. Yeah, it's such a bummer for the person who really coughed up, you know, the money to buy such a yeah. expensive item and it's not being used. So all right, Q six. How do you go about having the wedding budget conversation with both parents so everyone is on the same page? We definitely did touch on this a little bit, um, but Erin, tell me your thoughts on this one. I think part of it too is you're going to know a little bit before you get married what some of the pain points will be. Um, for instance, I know that uh, my mother feels strongly that shopping for the wedding dress is just a mother, daughter, and bridesmaids or sibling situation. Mm -hmm. So the mother of the room wouldn't necessarily be invited to that. And people are gonna get territorial. It's just gonna happen. I feel like it's part of the wedding experience. <laughs> so you guys can probably figure out ahead of time who will get a little territorial over what, and then try to figure out how to navigate that puzzle so everybody can amicably sit down and have a conversation. And what you said earlier about what you and Jordan did where you sit down individually and then bring everybody together is very helpful. 
I think it's also helpful that if, let's say the bride's parents are very traditional about it and they want to pay for everything, and then you maybe do have the groom's family pay for the rehearsal dinner. So Oh, little technical difficulty. They do feel Hopefully like we'll get Aaron back in just a few seconds. Oh, there you are. Can you oh, see me? Little, little glitchy. We lost your last sentence. Am I back? Yes, okay. you're back. It's, it's really at the end of the day about the open communication and trying to make people happy, but also putting your foot down on certain things. And totally. Oh, Totally. You know, I, I've, it's just, it's unfortunate. I've had three friends that have, um, throughout the wedding process, the wedding planning process have actually grown further and further apart from, you know, their mother-in-law or father-in-law mm -hmm. and the parents. Just, isn't that the complete opposite, um, point mm -hmm. of getting married? You're bringing two people together, but you're really merging two families together. And I just feel that if you could be crystal clear with, you know, every decision maker, I guess, you know, um, throughout the, the wedding planning process and also being politically correct at times, um, it's just going to make the whole wedding planning process that much more enjoyable. Mm -hmm. And people who are so stressed out the whole time, that's not what it's supposed to be. Um, yeah. So... Yeah, and I think you know the the mother of the groom never knows her place, mm -hmm. and I, you know it's up to us as women to like kind of figure out where that boundary does lie and what we include her in, what she doesn't get included in. So again, this woman's going to be in your life forever, um, right. and you never want you know you never want an overbearing mother-in-law. <laughs> the other tip I would have for um, and both sides of the equation for mm -hmm. for brides yep. and grooms that if they're if your partner has a sibling who is going through the wedding process take special note of how the parents are reacting for that one so you oh, kind of know what's coming down the pipeline and in addition so for example peach's older brother's engaged my boyfriend called peach his older brother's engaged they're getting married in october and it's been very nice to sort of observe how peach's mom as the mother of the groom which is the same scenario it would be for me is Feel like where she feels included, where she doesn't feel included, things that I would want to change for her dynamics that I would do differently. And at the same time, kind of going, oh, so that's probably going to be a little issue for us. Just putting that in the back of the mind for the future, what we'd need to remember. Little ping. Yeah. yeah. No, self. Totally. 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 And I think just honesty and actually sitting someone down and communicating. So many of my girlfriends who are just not communicating to the mother-in-law, it's just make it's like tangling the web. It's it's just making the web so much bigger. And, right. Um, communication in every aspect is just going to make it that much more, you know, clear for everyone. I, I just I've been living by the motto, Erin, um, you know, agreement make agreements, not expectations. You know, um That's like about it. Don't expect something of somebody, someone, you know, if, unless you've actually, you know, had a conversation about it and you came to come to a mutual agreement about it. And I think mm -hmm. wedding, there's so much emotion wrapped up in everything. Yeah. You can't possibly just expect, um, you know, because the, the emotions are going to take over. Right. Um, so again, this should be a, a happy, a happy time. Okay. Not time. All right. So we officially covered Q6 and Q7. So we are moving on to Q8. We do have 15 minutes left. So let's get moving on Q8. Here we go. Sending out Q8 right now. There we go. Sent out on Twitter. Sending it out on black. I'm actually really curious to hear your thoughts about this question in particular. All right, so Q8 is, is there such thing as a wedding loan? If not, what kind of loan is safe for us to take out when planning a wedding or don't even consider wedding loans? What's your thoughts? So first, there are some things called a wedding loan. There are also personal loan providers who will say you can use a personal loan for your wedding. It's not a specific wedding loan, but there are companies that target weddings. If a company is specifically targeting the wedding industry, you should probably run far, far away because the interest rates on those are likely insane. 
I advocate that no, you should never take out a loan for your wedding. You should never be going into debt for your wedding. I'm also realistic that people are not always gonna do that. So if you are going to be taking out a loan for your wedding, please shop around, find the absolute best rate. There are a ton of personal loan providers out there, many of which will do what's called a soft pull of your credit report. So it won't get your report to see if you're pre-approved and what your interest rate would be. That way you can shop around. And if you do all your shopping within a 14 day window, it's only going to count as one hard inquiry on your credit score. So it's not gonna annihilate that. Because okay. I know people get really nervous about the credit score and then they don't shop. Please shop around for the best rate, get as low as possible. And whoever has the higher credit score should be the one that's applying for the loan. Yeah, and read the fine print, right? Like, I feel like yes. this has always come along with a lot of other things. Like, sounds yeah. good, but let's, again, the ripple of the next year. But again, please just don't do it. Please just pay for it out of pocket. And especially if you're already in debt. Yeah. Avoid the loan even more, possibly. I mean, you're just going, kind of digging yourself into a deeper hole and you're trying to Absolutely. Right here. Yeah. All right. Well, I, and I, you know, you were saying if, if people, if a certain, um, resources, softwares, website are targeting wedding loans in particular run for the hills. I did see like a weddingloans.com resource. So again, be aware, look at all the mm -hmm. fine print interest rate. Don't use it. Yeah. <laughs> um, yes, please don't. Yeah. We got some Winnie Sun action here in our Twitter chat, retweeting all this awesome insight. All right, sending out Q9. Q9, we definitely did grace on as well, but we will. Always good to recap everyone. There's a lot of conversation and a lot of content tonight. Here we go. Sending out Q9 and sending it out here on Black. All right, so getting married could come along with making big purchases like a home or a car. How can we prepare best for a big purchase like this? Save early, save consistently. That's what you need to do. Yeah, and I think that's where, again, you know, thanks to our partner for Capital One tonight, you know, use, utilizing resources, especially if you're going to be swiping, you know, some sort of credit card, uh, the Buy Power card from Capital One is a great option to make your wedding expenses count towards the future. Talking about big purchases here, you know, every purchase can be used towards um, a, a purchase or a lease of a new car, Chevrolet, Buick, the or Cadillac. Jordan actually um, had a Cadillac, and it was such a great car. It was the Cadillac ATS, I think. Yes, I don't know them well. <laughs> so yeah, <laughs> and it is a really good sound system. We like had so much fun in that car. Very good backup camera as well. <laughs> <laughs> um, also important, saves you money not getting into accidents. Yes, and um, not bumping into things, that backup camera. Saves you on dings and scratches when you turn the car in. <laughs> um, all right, so being that we have nine minutes left, let's move on to Q10, being that we do yeah. have um, 15 questions, right? Yep. <laughs> all right, here we go. So impressed that I remembered the ATS. Cars are pretty, but not my thing, really. <laughs> Agreed. Especially living in New York. I don't own one. I haven't owned one in over five years at this point. Yeah. Are you originally from New York? No, I actually grew up overseas, fun fact. Oh. I'm not really originally from anywhere. Where, where were you born? I was born in Texas. I lived there for three months. Okay. Um, but I spent most of my childhood in Japan and China. How cool. Yeah. How interesting. Did you go to did you go to high school overseas? Yes. I was there from um, middle of fifth grade through graduating high school. And then my parents were there for another two and a half years. So I would go during college. I would go home to Shanghai, China. Amazing. Do you speak yeah. Chinese or Mandarin? Japanese? Indian, Indian, a little bit. I don't have a ton of practice anymore and then when I went to college I didn't have an Eastern right. language program so I didn't get to practice but a little bit I try 
Very cool fun fact. Um, yeah. All right, so Q10 just got sent out. Um, and it is, if you're going to pick one big splurge, I think this is, every, this is a personal preference for everyone, but if you're going to pick one big splurge when it comes to your wedding, what would your splurge be? For me, it would be an awesome DJ because I love to dance, as does my extended family. So we like to tear up the dance floor. Even though we're not always great dancers, that's what we're out there doing. <laughs> totally. I'm all about that. I feel like the people and the music is what makes a party fantastic. And, of course, a little booze action just loosens up the party as well. Um, but music is everything for sure. What's everybody else's big splurge? I will say that in the process of our wedding plans, I, um, I it was kind of like a unanimous thing amongst all, my, my aunt is my maid of honor, my mom and my aunt are sisters, and my grandma um, were all very, very close. And, um, you know, I, I, Jordan and I have actually known each other since we were 12, so we have, long history, our families are very intermingled, and I already feel married to him. Um, I would marry him in, you know, in my yeah. garage, honestly, and be very happy to be her. Um, so I kind of joke, both of us joke that our weddings are really for our families to just It is a lot of parties for everyone, I think, um, which is fine. Yeah. Totally fine. Um, you know, we just, I decided I didn't need a bridal shower, yeah. we didn't need an engagement party. It was just like, let's just, you know, celebrate at the wedding and make the weekend fantastic. Um, but I did, you know, nice, I did splurge a little bit on a dress. I would say that's probably where the ridiculous purchase. And if that's what you valued, of, of the, that's what you valued. Exactly. You got to pick what it is, though. Everybody has, everybody has to have their thing. And... All right, prepping Q11, just got sent on Twitter. Five minutes to go, we're doing good. Okay, sending it out on Blab as well. Let someone freak out. Freaked out when my husband told me how much he spent on the photographer, but oh my God, I was so happy he did. Well, you know what, the pictures are, you know, kind of yep. what lives on forever, of course, with your memories, but pictures are always great. That's another that's another thing that um, Jordan did really smart that we tell definitely like to share too. My family friend is a professional photographer, and he had her hiding in the bushes when he proposed to me. Mm -hmm. So the entire reaction and moment was one hundred percent captured. And you know when you when you get proposed to, or when I got proposed to, I you kind of black out. Oh. Um, <laughs> So being able to relive it through the pictures was really fun and really exciting. And it doesn't have to be a professional photographer. It could be someone with their iPhone, their smartphone, their, right. you know, GoPro, whatever. But um, if you can stage someone to kind of capture your moment, you will be so happy to be able to, like, look at that moment and frozen in time forever, which is really exciting. We told our, our really good friends that, and, you know, they saw the pictures, and they – our friend just recently proposed in Italy and he literally stopped a stranger mm -hmm. before getting down on one knee without her noticing somehow. And in Italy still captured the moment with his iPhone. So that was really um, kudos to him. But again, if you can capture and the, the images from steal the his phone. and the stranger didn't steal his phone. Can you imagine? You just engage, and then someone's on the phone. It's like, what are you going to do, right? I'm sure it happens. <laughs> of course it's definitely happened. I mean, I don't know, Erin. <laughs> All right, so a Q11, it has, been, it has been tradition that the bride's family is responsible for paying for the wedding. What do you think about that? It's 2016. What are your thoughts? <sighs> um... My thoughts are respect what your family wants to do. If your parents feel strongly that they want to help contribute and it's not an emotionally abusive situation where they try to completely take control, then let them do it. But at the same time, I don't think we can expect that anymore. And 
you need to be grateful for what your parents are willing to give you. You know, if all they can afford is five grand towards your wedding, then thank God you just got five grand for your wedding. Don't feel like, whoa, what so and so got twenty thousand dollars? Like this isn't a competition. Be grateful totally. for what you get. Totally, and I think for any person, you know, in 2016 to think that, you know, the bride's family is solely responsible for everything is just a little silly and um, a little stuck in the past. And again, of course, it all depends on everyone's financial situation, what everyone's comfortable doing. Um, that obviously comes along with communicating where everyone's comfort level is. But my reaction is, oh, please, like it is 2016. Yeah. And it is not all about the bride's family. And I also think, um, you know, just side note, side question, a lot of my girlfriends and I are having a conversation about what we're doing about our last names. And I think it's also something, um, you know what, I'm jumping ahead here. Let's go to Q12, then I'll finish my thought here. <laughs> Sending out Q12. Prep that answer, Erin. Here we go, we are coming down to the end. Okay. Which my answer to Q12 actually is about name change. Oh, we're, we're on the same page. Okay. All right. Q12 is what traditions do you think millennials are bringing or breaking during the wedding planning process today? So I'd say we're bringing the hashtag. That certainly wasn't done for our parents. 100%. And that's for like everybody, all they care about is the hashtag. It seems like that's one of the more stressful parts of planning your wedding. Um, and breaking is, name change is a big one, that not all women are changing their names um, or that men are taking women's names or they're doing some mashup version of their names or they're both hyphenating. We're completely redefining that part of a, of a marriage. And your name doesn't define the marriage, but it's nice to respect your partner's wishes in that regard. Um, so that's another thing to have open, honest communication about before you get married. Absolutely, and that's what I was about to say and then realized what our 12 was. Um, but I totally, and I actually didn't even think about the hashtags, and you're so right. And I am so impressed with the creative hashtags that people create. I'm like, oh my God, that is such a great hashtag. Um, yeah. Like our, our friends just who it's, just, it's yeah. pressure. It is pressure for sure to have a hashtag. Our yeah. our last our friend's last name is Schneer, and theirs was Cheers to the Schneers. Um, I'm trying to think of other ones. Oh, and then another yeah. friend was has a little bit of a yeah. I don't even know how to pronounce the last name. I'm not even going to try it. But it was another really creative one. Um, Jordan and I are just going super generic and um, easy and we kind of created our own like logo for the wedding that's going to be in some exciting places and it just hashtag CJXO. Um, so just simple, easy to remember. You don't have to, you know, type a hundred million things and you know, when you're a little tipsy, you could easily do CJXO. So, <laughs> um, yeah. But yeah, I know yeah. speaking about just breaking traditions, I think the coolest thing is that, you know, women are not, um, it, it's not about women kind of having to like lose their identity of who they are, who they've been their entire life. And then, you know, all of a sudden they become a, a different name. Um, and I feel like I'm proud to be a cross. You know, I've also yep. for, you know, women like us, and especially because we have platforms like social media to kind of grow our own brand and, I, and our identity, um, yeah. put time and energy and money into growing that brand and, and, and establishing ourselves, and to all of a sudden, you know, have that name change just because you got married is a little silly to me. And especially if your partner is supportive of that, then Amen. yeah, so all the power to us. Um, and if your partner isn't supportive at first, doesn't mean they won't come around. That was a conversation we had to go back to a couple okay. of times. It wasn't that he wasn't supportive, but he was a little bit um, surprised, I guess. He, he assumed that's just what would happen. That's the way everybody in his family had done it. My mom right. did it. Why wouldn't I do it? And, I feel like if a, so, if a guy yeah. hasn't maybe thought of it before and it just kind of I could see them being like, whoa, what? You don't want my last name? I think it's also like when you have children, yeah. what happened, you know? What happens there? Yeah, you cross that bridge when you that's get there. That's a great answer. That's a great answer. I also feel like you know what? That's where I have no problem with 
with my, you know, future husband's name. It's, you know, it's, I, again, personal preference, where, yeah. where everyone's comfortable, cross the bridge when it comes. I like that answer, too. <laughs> All right, Q13. Yeah. Instead of stashing our money away, how can we best regulate our money and still gain rewards? Well, you should be saving first, not last. That is for sure. Um, it shouldn't be you save whatever you have left over at the end of the month. You save right up top, right before, as soon as you get paid. Mm -hmm. It should be automating into savings. And then, of course, cash back cards. If it's not enticing you to spend outside of your regular spending habits, if you're not spending more just because you're using a card, then that's a great, easy way to be earning a little bit extra. And you can even just stash that into Absolutely. savings. Absolutely. And that definitely, you know, comes along with the buy power card that we keep talking about, too, um, which I keep sending out some information on Twitter if you're interested in hearing about some of the perks of the buy power card as well. So um, card holders receive 5% earnings on their first $5,000 in purchases every year, and then unlimited 2% earnings on purchases after that. So again, when you're making a purchase and it has a good, you know, ripple effect, that's always a, a perk as well. All right, well, we are a few minutes over. We got two more questions to go. Um, so let's just send out Q14. And we, after that, we'll just have one more question for the evening. Here we go. Q14 being sent out on Twitter right now. Here is on Blab. I love how much engagement we get on Blab. This, um, the IM feed on Blab is such a great component. Do you use Blab a lot? Do you like Blab? Did you earn? This is actually my first blab, and I am digging it, so it's going to be a new thing. Oh, yeah. I, I feel like it's such a great platform. And you can also tweet directly from blab as well, which is uh, a nice component. All right, so Q14. What is proper etiquette when deciding on what gift to get a bride and groom? Like, I, I guess, you know, when meaning proper etiquette when you're getting a gift or writing a check, um, how do you decide? I feel like this answer always really changes. Um, I think when you're younger, $50 is probably appropriate if it's also kind of what you can afford. Um, for me now, personally, I do 75 per person. If I'm buying a gift and I can find some sort of deal or something on sale, then I go above that threshold, but I'm not spending more than that, but they're getting more value than that. Um, I actually, fun hack for a gift buying, I always buy, especially okay. if they're registered at places like Macy's, I always buy on like Memorial Day weekend, Labor Day weekend, because there's huge sales, and then you can get something off their registry at like 25% yeah. off, and then if you want, you can toss something else in and still stay within your budget, and they think you are being super, super gracious and generous. Yeah. Um, and then the other thing is, <laughs> if you don't know the bride and groom well, just stay on That's registry. Super. Don't risk getting them something they really don't want. Mm -hmm. Right. I know that's what the register yeah. is there for, to like tell you what, what it is the bride and groom want, right? <laughs> um, I also heard um, a rule of thumb, again, take, take it with a grain of salt, but I did just recently hear this, and I had not heard it before, and I heard it from a fellow millennial. Um, when you have no idea what to necessarily give the bride and groom, aside from what you can financially afford, if you can kind of estimate how much per person, the cost per person of the, at the wedding venue, you know, it could be $50 per person, $200 per person, depending on the wedding, depending on the friend or family member, that's what you could attempt to give them as a gift. Yeah, that's part of the reason um, I like I've never heard before. Yeah, exactly. Which is a good like medium range there. Um, which I, I thought that was, um, interesting way of thinking because um majority and i are like you know ha, you know lots of friends coming up um and that rule of thumb was like yeah. oh okay that kind of makes sense all right um we're already in our last question of the evening thank you so much for everyone staying so engaged and we're um, definitely over time but we are still flooded with a lot of conversation um but q15 just went out and let's send it out on lab here. Mm -hmm. 
this is a great question to end on because I think this is um, a funny one. <laughs> so Q15, what is the best way to decide bridesmaids and groomsmen budget? Uh, you know, being in the bridal party really comes along with a lot of costs. Like, are you demanding what they wear? I was in a bridal party where color nail polish along with the jewelry, the shoes. I'm surprised she didn't tell us what underwear to wear. Love her, but true story. So what do you yeah. think? They are really tough. Um, I did the math <laughs> recently and I actually figured out that you probably will spend about $15,000 going to other people's weddings. So keep it cheap when you can. And oh, yeah, cause if gosh. you think about like in your, life. in your lifetime, but if you consider how much it costs just to be in one. And let's say you're gonna be in at least one or two. And then right. like, assuming you have siblings and maybe your spouse or your partner has siblings and you'd at the minimum be in those. And then once you couple up, you're going to some like weddings that you wouldn't normally have gone to because it's your partner's friends. It gets crazy. Right. I think that as a bride and groom, you just, you need to be respectful of people's budgets. You also need to be aware of what phase of your life you're getting married. If you are in your early 20s, and even to your mid twenties, people probably don't have the extra capital to be throwing a bunch of money at your wedding. So just be really aware of how much you're asking for shoes and dresses and bachelor parties and all of that stuff. And then, you know, as you phase into being older and you might have the money, they don't necessarily want to spend it on you. <laughs> just keep that in mind. <laughs> and you know what's but, so funny about the whole thing is that your bridesmaids or your groomsmen are supposed to be your closest people. Yeah. So it's just so funny like put your 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 most important people your vips like in in a hole you know yeah um, and i do I, advocate I saving for other people's weddings i'm really big on that mm. start a savings account in your when you're about 25 start putting like 25 bucks a paycheck because wedding get in will oh. come for you it comes for us all and then you don't have to figure out how to budget for it later hope Absolutely. And honestly, you know, for all the brides out there, um, it is one of the biggest wedding trends of 2016 where brides are not asking uh, their bridesmaids to all have the same dress. And I, um, I told my bridesmaids, just get a, my bridal party is going to be black. Um, and I said, you know, any black gown, whether it's one shoulder, off the shoulder, halter, crisscross, as long as it's black, even I said black, white, silver, as long as there's an element of black, white, and silver, I'm happy for you to wear it, even if you have it already, um, because you honestly, one, everyone can wear a black gown or dress again, and mm -hmm. two, a you know, powder pink, poofy bridesmaid's dress is just $200 mm -hmm. down the drain. So don't do that to your, to your best friends. Just don't do that. Yeah, so true. <laughs> And also, well, you can say no. Erin, you don't have to be in the bridal party if you don't want to. Just something to consider. That's true. That's very, very true. I've never heard of someone declining to. Actually, yes, I have. That yes, I have. That's totally true. You could just say, mm -hmm. "I can't financially afford to commit to your wedding party." Um, yeah. Erin, thank you so much for spending a little bit more time with us. This was That's so really much. Um, so much information. Of course, you could make sure to uh, follow Erin at broke millennial on Twitter. She's always giving tons of financial tips, advice, insight, lots of articles as well. It was a pleasure having you. Love Thank always you. having you in the Talk community. And of course, for any information on the Biopower Car, just visit um, biopowercar.com. And Erin, uh, have a fantastic night. Tell Peaches Thank I said you. hello. Yeah. I will. And, um, I, we will not be having a Twitter chat next week. I'll be, I will be in Chicago um, at Sage Summit. So we'll see you not next week, the following week, um, everybody here back um, for Millennial Talk. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful night. And thank you again, Erin, for a great chat. Thanks. Bye, everybody.